Wherever there are shadows, there are people ready to kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. This is Bleeding Daylight with your host, Rodney Olson. Welcome to Bleeding Daylight. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Find the links at bleedingdaylight.net. Thanks to those who have left reviews on their favourite podcast apps. It helps others discover Bleeding Daylight and it's a huge encouragement. Grief touches us all, but how do we deal with it well and how do we walk alongside others experiencing grief? Today's guest will help us all learn from her experience and help us all face one of life's difficulties in a better way. How do you keep going when tragedy strikes? Is there ever a way to overcome grief that feels so overwhelming? Kim Peacock has faced the devastating loss of her oldest daughter, Nicole. She has written about her own healing journey in her book, Victoria's Heart. I'm very pleased to have Kim as my guest on Bleeding Daylight today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Rodney. I really appreciate it. There's so much to explore in your story, but... I want to begin by asking about family life before the loss of your daughter. What did life look like back then? Back then, it was a little bit of chaos and a little bit of fun, but it was usually happy chaos. We had a blended family. Our oldest daughter, Nicole, was 17. Our daughter, Lisa, was 16, and she was from my husband's previous marriage. Nicole was from my previous marriage. And then we had our daughter, Megan, who was 11 at that time, and then we had adopted our son, Alex, from Russia a year prior to that time. So he was just a four-year-old learning English, learning how to live in a new family and a new culture, and everything was exciting and new for him. So it was a good kind of chaos at that stage. (laughs) Yes. And and quite a a large family. What did that look like on a day-to-day basis? I, I guess it's really the normal family things that we would expect. Exactly. Really, it was the typical blended family. The two older girls showed horses extensively. So on any given weekend, we could be loading up the horse trailer and hay and traveling sometimes a couple hours, sometimes eight hours away for the girls to compete in horse shows. At, and they ended up competing at a high level. So that was a big part of our family. Then with our middle daughter, Megan, and well, she's our youngest daughter, Megan and Lisa, they would also participate in dance classes, dance dance competitions. And then Alex, the youngest, he raced motorcycles and rode motorcycles. So we were very busy. My husband traveled, so we had the opportunity to travel with him because we homeschooled. And so we were together all the time. And yes, it was a good chaos, a little bit, uh, we call it happy chaos. It was very typical of what a normal blended family, busy, engaged, having fun, not perfect. We definitely had our ups and downs, but pretty average in the way that we lived our everyday life. And then came this dark moment. Lead us up to that moment. It was just three days after Christmas, and actually, I want to backtrack a little bit. About three weeks before Christmas, I was sweeping the kitchen floor, and my husband, Larry, said to me, you know, Kim, we need to be ready in case anything were to happen to one of our kids. And I was not happy about that comment, and I just snapped back at him, and I said, you know what? That is not going to happen because God would not give me anything I couldn't handle. And I really believed that at the time, which is not biblical, but that's a whole that's a whole nother topic. But I really did believe that if I did everything I was supposed to do, things would fairly go smoothly. Well, then we had Christmas, big Christmas holiday. Usually after Christmas, we tried to take a little bit of break of a break and go on a family vacation. A lot of those times we went to Pismo Beach on the West Coast in California. We were getting ready to do that. Our daughter, Lisa, wasn't able to go because she had a basketball tournament. So she stayed back and stayed with my parents who lived next door to us. And so we all loaded up our K-2 
camping gear, all of our goods, Christmas wrapping and everything still on the floor of our house. And we took off to go to Pismo Beach. And I think that's about four hours away from us. Well, we met some other family members up there and we set up our tents and our camp and proceeded to go out onto the sand dunes to ride ATVs and to go off-roading. Everybody was having a good time and everybody was, you know, racing around, playing, and it was a lighthearted day. And I remember thinking, things cannot get any more perfect. The sun was shining. It just felt like everything was perfect. About that time, I looked up on one of the high dunes and I caught a glimpse of someone going off a high dune on a three-wheeler. And they went straight off this high dune and was plunging down to the bottom. Time slowed down as I realized that that was our daughter, Nicole, our oldest daughter. Apparently, she had gotten disoriented, took a wrong turn, and went off this high dune. And she did land at the bottom, and the ATC, the three-wheeler, landed on top of her. My husband got to her first, and between him and my father-in-law, they pulled her helmet off, began actually doing CPR because she was unresponsive. We called the paramedics, and by the time we got her to the hospital, they had told us she had died at the beach. And that was the darkest point in our whole lives. We went from being that happy chaos to being plunged into a dark place. And it is that moment where the world completely changes. And I imagine that there's lots of things, especially surrounding that kind of time frame, that you would find it difficult to to go back to. There's things like a family holiday. How can we ever have a holiday again with the memory of what happened? Christmas, you 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 had to return home to to wrapping still on the on the floor. How could you ever celebrate Christmas again? How do you start to to walk forward from that moment? And that's a great question. It was very difficult. I couldn't bring myself to go into our house. So we ended up staying at my parents' house who lived right next door. And we'd only go in to our home just to get what we needed and then leave again. Because the ordinary just seemed so foreign to us after that. So it was took little steps of every day, just walking through each day and taking care of the next step. And honestly, sometimes that was just getting out of bed, taking care of what was in front of us. There are very small incremental changes that we had to make to, to adjust to this new life without Nicole. And it was devastating. There were times that I felt like I couldn't get out of bed. And there's times that I felt like there was no way I was going to survive. But Every day, I would try to give the Lord my pain, give God my pain, and wrestle with that, wrestle with what that looked like for us. And so I would say very, very small steps and realizing that it's okay for us not to have things the way they were before. Um, Christmases have looked a lot different for us in the years since then and allowed ourselves to know, okay, what what traditions can we let go and what traditions should we keep? That's just a small example of just even adjusting to the holidays. But every day we had to learn how to do that new day again and kind of adjust to our new normal. As we know, when going through grief, there are several stages and there are things like denial, just this can't be happening, this can't be true. But there's also this blaming. Did that happen for you and for your family? Was there a sense of who do I blame? Do I blame myself? Do I blame others? We definitely struggled with that. Your first instinct when something tragic happens in your family is to blame, to cast blame. I think it's our way of creating a reason for it to kind of to figure out why it happened. But we realized early that we had to be really careful about that. You know, we wanted to blame the hospital. We wanted to blame even the ATC, the three-wheeler. We wanted to blame each other. But we, but my biggest thing is I wanted to blame myself because if I hadn't have encouraged Nicole to 
you know, take her turn writing or if we hadn't taken that trip. So we had to be careful about that because that's a dangerous pit to fall in. So early on, my husband and I talked about it and we're, and we really realized that we need to throw that anytime those thoughts of blame came into our mind, we needed to get rid of them as quickly as we could. And that was for our relational health and our own emotional and spiritual health as well. There's this time that is such a a deep trauma, such a a deep tragedy that you're having to face for yourself. But at the same time, you can't stop being a mum. So you're having to help your kids through this trauma. How was that for you? In some ways, it was life-saving, and in some ways, it was hard. And the way I see it as being life-saving is my eyes had to stay on them and make sure that they were doing okay, because I had to not get so wrapped up in my own grief. I had to take time to grieve, yes, and to embrace that grief and to to begin to heal, but I also had to make sure they were doing okay. And everyone grieves differently. And as I saw each one of my kids, they had different needs and they had different relationship with their sister. They also had a a a special relationship with me and my husband. So we had to really be careful to pay attention to them, but still allow time for our own selves to grieve and to create a space in our family to allow each one of us, my husband and I included, to grieve in the way that brought most healing to us. I do believe it's important to grieve and to allow that, but we could not allow ourselves to go down into the pit because we knew also that that pit of despair could be damaging to all of us. You've touched there on the fact that grieving is different for everyone and grieving actually takes a longer time for some than others. Did you ever feel pressure from outside of well, you, you've had your grieving period, now let's move forward? Or did people give you license to, to grieve at your own pace? I did feel that pressure from some. And basically, it would be like, well, aren't you over it yet? It's been six months. You know, aren't you doing okay? Why are you still struggling? And I think for those people, they just didn't understand just the complexity of grief. And grief, you you know, can be high one day. You're the the stress level can just be so high that it's hard to handle. And then the next day you can feel like, oh, I'm doing okay. And then it could come crashing in again. That was one of those things I had to not compare myself to others and not compare my kids to each other. But there is a cultural expectation of a certain amount of time or certain things that you should be over. And I think even in our Christian circles as Christ followers, I think there's even different expectations in that as well. And you're having to deal with this, as you mentioned, the different rates of grief, the different expressions of grief within your own family. And whilst life was never going to get back to so-called normal, I guess it does get back to some kind of normal, and that would be happening at different rates within your family, wouldn't it? Yes, exactly. And that normal is kind of hard because after you know three or four months, everybody has to go back to work, everybody has to go back to school, but I still feel crushed. And my kids and my husband, we still feel crushed, but we do have to go back to work. The kids have to go back to school. So to be able to do that in a way to create margin for that grief time, but still be able to go back to the new normal. And because we did homeschool, it was easier for our two youngest. And we we were a member of a satellite school that really gave us a lot of mercy and grace during that time. You know, as long as we covered the the core subjects, they understood how that would be, especially for our daughter, Megan, you know, who was 11 at that time. So they understood that, but it did take each one of us a little bit of a different amount of time to ease back into that normal and learn to act the way we needed to in our in that new culture of our family. How about those around you that were, were giving support? Were there some that were just there and ready to give that support, and yet others who didn't quite know how to handle it and so withdrew from you? 
Oh, that is a great question. Yeah, we had a big portion of our church supported us in amazing ways. They would come in without expectation, fill the refrigerator with food, put bottled water on the counter, take care of our animals. We still had the horses and kids that they knew would come and exercise the horses. So in that way, people would come in and take care of our physical needs without expectation of how we would react to that. And that was such a blessing for us because we could not handle a lot of questions, a lot emotionally. We couldn't handle a lot of conversation. When people would ask a lot of questions or things like that, that would be a little hard on us. But the ones who helped the most would just, who would just show up, give us a hug, not talk a lot, but always be there. They would send us cards often, even just stopping by often. But on the other hand, I do know that there were people that didn't come around because they really did not know what to say. And I understand that grief creates a really awkward situation, especially if you don't know what to say. And so there were people who did withdraw from us because grief is uncomfortable and grief hurts. And they didn't mean harm to us, but they just did not know how to handle our pain. And that raises another interesting topic. You mentioned there that when people asked a lot of questions, that was uncomfortable for you. You you were really grateful for those who just gave you a hug. And we hear from different people, again, that they experience things differently, that there are some people who say, I recognize that I've lost my loved one and I want to talk about that, where mm-hmm. some people want to avoid the question they actually do want to talk about that person. And yet sometimes for for those who are grieving, no, I don't want to talk about that just now. How do we navigate that? For those of us who are wanting to support people going through grief, how do we navigate that? That I think is so important to just have that communication. When someone would even ask us, you know, do you want, can we help you? Can we talk to you? Do you, do you want to talk about it? And in the beginning, we couldn't talk about it. And then as each one of us grew through that, we, you know, we were ready at different points. But even just having people ask, are you comfortable with this? Do you want me to? mentioned Nicole's name. And then there were different stages through that. Later on, it was life-giving when people would tell me stories about Nicole, when people would tell me ways that she blessed them with her life. Those were life-giving. So I know that it is a very delicate situation, but just communicate with your hurting friends what can I do to help? Do you want to talk about it? I think those kind of things, don't be afraid to ask, but don't keep asking a lot of detailed questions, especially if there's been an accident, unless they say, you know, you can say, do you want to talk about it? Do you want to talk about the accident? And there probably will be a time that they do. Um, But like you said, everybody is different. And so you just want to, the main thing is to show up for people when they're hurting, just kind of read their cues. If they start talking about it, listen and go in there with them. But if they are very quiet, it might be a time just to give them a hug and, you know, maybe write them a card for later. So those are some things that were helpful for us. You lost Nicole back in 1998. And now you have this book, Victorious Heart. When was it that you decided that you would write down your story, your family story of of going through this process? I was always a journaler. And I so I journaled through my grief process. And that was a part of my healing to be able to write those things down. But after we lost Nicole, I felt kind of isolated because I did not know, as far as in my grief, I didn't really know what to expect. And I had a hard time finding resources that I really felt helped me walk through those different, not even necessarily stages of grief, but I call them seasons of grief. I started having a passion to help other people, to help other people walk through their grief journeys. And so I just would visit with women who had lost their kids. We would just minister to them as people would have those situations, especially in our church. About eight years ago, I really felt the Lord prompting in my heart that I needed to start writing these things down so that I could create a guidebook, so to speak, for people who are struggling. And so I started writing the book 
over time, I had to keep digging a little deeper and digging a little bit deeper. And through that process, I also found more healing, but also being able to kind of line out our grief journey and write down some things that were helpful for us, but also realizing everybody grieves differently. And at the end of each chapter in my book, there's a section called grief notes. Then there's a section called uh, loving them well. Grief notes is kind of the cliff version of whatever that chapter is about. Because for me personally, it was hard for me to concentrate on a lot of words through, especially for the first few months of our grieving process. So I would just have just the cliff notes of grieving them well. These are some things that can help you. And then loving them well is some just some helpful hints for people who are walking with those who are grieving. I want to ask about the title because you didn't call the book anything like Coping with Grief or Walking Through Grief. It's Victorious Heart. Tell me about that victory. Oh, Victorious Heart. I love the word victory. After Nicole went to heaven, a friend of ours gave us a bookmark that had Nicole's name at the top and what her name meant, and it means Victorious Heart. So those words described Nicole's life perfectly. She was free and wild as far as wild in the good way, just nothing. She did not let um, the culture stigmas hold her down. She loved people freely. And so when I saw that bookmark, I thought, you know what, that is how I want to live. I want to live with a victorious heart. And over time, those words like warrior, victory, those kind of things started resonating with my heart. Because when you're in grief, that's the last thing you feel. You do not feel like a victor. You feel hopeless. You don't feel hopeful. And so those kind of words started resonating with me and showing me that those were how I wanted to live, that I could still grieve because grief is real. Sorrow is real. Our hearts are in deep pain when we lose someone. But then on the other side of that, we can have victory in that and we can live with victorious hearts. That's where that the title of the book came. And that's how I learned to be a victor by every day taking all of my pain and giving it to God. I could not fight that battle on my own. That battle was only able to be fought by giving my pain to God every single day. And those little incremental steps of healing started happening. And that's how I learned to be victorious is not by my own, because on my own, I am a big wimp. But with God's help, I learned to be a victor. And you have touched on your faith a number of times. I want to explore that just a a little bit, Mm -hmm. because things that happen within our lives can either serve to push us further away from God or to draw us in. Tell me about your experience. I had to really wrestle with that at first because what I I had to decide if what I believed before Nicole died, was that true? Was it true in my pain? And at first I was pretty angry with God. I doubted my faith and I thought, how can all of this be real? Because as I said before, I believed that if I did everything that I was supposed to do, then God would not give me more than I could handle. And that is not in the Bible. That is not theologically sound at all. Everybody on this earth struggles and everybody has tragedies. So what I came to realize that is in that tragedy, in that hardship, God came and he did not shy away from my questions. When I was angry at him, he did not turn his face away from me. His eyes were on me during those hardest, hardest times. And I really do believe even when I was doubting him, he was right with me and he would pick me up and carry me through those days. Scripture talks about that he collects our tears in a bottle. And a God that loves and sees me that deeply and that intimately, that he sees every one of my tears. He is right with me. And so during that process, I learned instead of fighting God, pushing him away, I would learn to basically turn my hands up and give my pain to him. So my faith grew and I, I mean, I have a long ways to go. I, I have such a long ways to go, but I feel like I can see him more clearly. It's not a theological 
thing that I can put my finger on except that he is there with me right constantly carrying me through every step of my pain. And he didn't take away my pain, but he carried me through my pain. We talked earlier about how you not only had to deal with your own grief, but you had to deal with the the grief of your children as well. When it came to faith, how did you and your husband deal with actually sharing that faith with your children in leading them in faith at that time? We talked to them a lot about heaven, and we talked to them a lot about how Nicole was more alive in heaven than we were on earth. Now, sometimes it didn't feel like it. Sometimes in my pain, I didn't even really feel it. We just would talk to them about how much God loves us and that He sacrificed so that Nicole could be in heaven. And there's the scripture that talks about that we don't think on the things that we can see, that, but that we think on the things that are unseen because those are eternal. And so trying to even explain to them how there is so much more than what we can see here on this earth. Each one of them walked through that in a different way. And ultimately, their faith became their own more when they became adults. And they struggled in their own ways with that. But I think just even just showing them, even allowing them to see our pain, not acting like everything was okay, but allowing them to see our pain, that made them understand that God was comfortable with their pain as well. You wrote the book for other people who are in a broken place, who are going through grief. What has been the response? What has been the feedback that has come through from people that have read through the book? My goal in writing the book was that people would not feel alone and that they would be seen. And the overriding responses that I have that I have received have been that people have felt seen, that they felt like, oh, I am not crazy. Somebody else understands how I feel. Because sometimes you, when you are hurting, you don't know, is this, is this normal? And there's really no normal in grief, but people will just say, oh, just to know that someone else felt like this, someone else thought these things, that this is how she handled it and it will help other people kind of go through those steps. Also to have them know that they have freedom to grieve in their own way, that there's hope and that the Lord will carry them through and not to compare their grief to others. All these years later, you're still on a journey. Is there still grief that you have to deal with day to day? Yes. I think about Nicole every day, especially as one of the kids or one of Nicole's friends get married, or now they're to the place where they're having children and older children. And I do think about that. What would that have been like to have Nicole as a peer now? The grief becomes part of me, and I think it becomes part of anyone who has lost someone. So it's always there underneath. But now I understand that that grief also coincides with joy and peace and the beauty part of it. So even though basically I I walk with a limp now, I, that's the only way, not physical limp, but my heart limps because she's always there under the surface. And as we grow older, we lose other people. And so it becomes part of us, but also to understand that doesn't define us. We can be victorious in that and not be defined by our grief. I'm sure that must be enormously freeing for a lot of people who are of the belief that grief is a process you go through, get over, and then you don't worry about it anymore. But to realize, yes, there are sadnesses in our past that will touch us from time to time, but they don't have to have that control over us. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's part of why you wrote the book for people. Yes, that is really a big part of why I wrote the book, because sometimes we feel like if we quit if we allow the grief to consume us then we're honoring our loved ones because we're we will not let go of that grief i don't know if that's the case with everyone but for me i kind of had that guilt when like oh i need to really hold on to that because if i let go of that i'm letting go of nicole that wasn't true for me what was true is i learned when i gave god my pain and i started living my life 
and it was incremental. It wasn't linear. It was incremental. When I started living my life with more freedom and allowing the the healing to start taking place, that was actually honoring Nicole's memory and honoring the gift that God has given me in life. It's a really cool thing to be able to think, I can still grieve Nicole and grieve the loss of not having her here on earth, but at the same time knowing that I, if I live my life well here, if I spend every second living victoriously, then I am actually honoring her memory and those that who, all of those who have gone before us. We're talking about the book Victoria's Heart, a book that goes deep into Kim's story, but as well as that, has those summaries that help you to just pick up on the things you need to know while you're in grief, but also for people who are trying to walk beside those going through grief. Kim, if people want to get hold of this book, where's the easiest place to find you and the book? You can get Victoria's Heart anywhere books are sold, Amazon or any place where you can buy a book. Also on my website, wildvictoriousheart.com, there's a link on there that will connect you to any of those sites as well. So it's easy to get on my website as well. I have blogs and different things to encourage people walking through grief and also that there's ways to get a hold of me. I try to answer all my emails and correspondence just so I can support others as they're walking through those really dark days. Kim, it's been a wonderful time to talk with you about the the grief that you continue to deal with, but that doesn't hold you back and your ability to share that grief with others and to bring them in on a journey and let them know that they're not alone. I want to thank you for your time today on Bleeding Daylight. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Bleeding Daylight. Please help us to shine more light into the darkness by sharing this episode with others. For further details and more episodes, please visit bleedingdaylight.net.